Welcome class to a new unit and in collaboration with Dr. Jacobo we are putting together a series of lecture films as you already have seen it and this unit deals with the Bracero and I'm going to let Professor Jacobo to do this because he's not only an expert, he's written a book and his family came to the U.S. through the Bracero program. So with no further ado, here is Professor Jacobo. Let's continue with the push and pull factors. In this section, we'll discuss the Bracero program, one of the most controversial bilateral agreements between the United States and Mexico. Let me first step back a little bit and give you some context. Let's not forget that in previous discussions, we went over the Great Depression, the very difficult years for all Americans, and in particular for immigrants and Mexican Americans as well. There was a very strong anti-Mexican sentiment that gave rise to the Mexican problem idea. Ironically enough, it was at the height of the anti-Mexican sentiment during the Great Depression that the seed for the next pull factor will be placed. Not in the United States, not in Mexico, but in Germany with the rise of the Third Reich. The rise of the Third Reich led, of course, to the beginning of the Second World War in the European theater. As we know, the United States was neutral for the years of 39 and 40. However, the American uh, businesses were beginning to enjoy the profits of war. There was a great demand for agricultural products and military hardware. In fact, there are a few studies about this, frankly, but there was secret negotiations going on between the agricultural department in the United States and the Mexican government, trying to bring back to the United States agricultural workers. Of course, this was kind of a challenge because after all, in the 1930s, the American government, and frankly the American people in general, blamed Mexicans for much of the economic collapse of the economy during this period. So how do you, if you will negotiate, how do you convince the American people that you need Mexicanos to come back? This again leads us to the pull factor known as the Bracero Program. So let's talk about the Bracero Program. What was so controversial about it? First of all, let me begin by telling you that there's plenty of evidence that American lobbyist pressure was more focused on an open border. It was the American farmers, many businesses that proposed there, that there'd be no border, that Mexicanos would be allowed to enter freely. It was the Mexican government that proposed a binational agreement that would be regulated uh, with working visas, again, which became the Bracero program. So let's talk about some of the details. What was so, again, controversial about this program? The program began in 1942, and really it happened uh, because of the uh, Pearl Harbor attack by the Japanese Navy. That gave the United States a legitimate, if you will, uh, reason why they could enter a negotiation with the Mexican government to bring in workers to the United States. Now back then, the initial agreement had four main points to it. The very first point was that Mexican people coming to the United States, and mainly men, to work were to be exempted from military service. They were here primarily, primarily here, to work. And, and part of that, frankly, is that the Mexican nation was sending a, uh, a message to the Axis powers. We are not allies of the United States in this conflict. We are here to work. This eventually would change because by 1943, the Mexican Republic would also declare war on the Axis powers. So point number one again was that the Mexicans were here to primarily work. The second point of this agreement is very interesting, and that is that the uh, Mexican people were supposed to be protected against any racial discrimination of any kind. Obviously, uh, the Mexican government was worried about the decades of anti-Mexican sentiment, in particular the 1930s, with the repatriation program, the Mexican problem, uh, John Box from Texas and his racist uh, uh, policies. Now you have a government that is saying, you want workers? They can go to, to, to work in the United States, but again, uh, you must protect them. And in fact, um, people do not know much about this, but uh, the Bracero program initially boycotted the state of Texas. It was not until 1943 that Texas passed what is called the Good Never Policy, that basically allowed Mexico to be able to lift the ban 
on Texas. But it shows us, again, a pull factor. It shows us dependency on Mexican labor by the United States uh, in this case when it comes to the war effort and the need for agricultural core supplies. The third point of the agreement was that the Mexican worker uh, was to be paid for coming to work in the United States, uh, paid to live here, and paid to go back home to be repatriated. This is very interesting again because what we see is a Mexican nation that has, if you will, a very strong position in the negotiating table. They're, a they're able to tell the American people, the American government, you want us? Well, pay us to go there, to live there, to work with you, and to come back home. That worked only at the beginning uh, because, after all, the Americans were at war and they needed workers very close to the border, not so far south in Mexico. So eventually that, uh, that part of the agreement does not work, frankly, for the United States and uh, it leads to many other problems that we can discuss as we go forward. But uh, that was the third point of the agreement. Finally, the fourth point, you might find it very interesting, was that uh, no Mexican bracero or worker should be replacing an American worker. That's something that perhaps even in today's uh, uh, debate over immigration, um, you know, we can also discuss. So let's talk about who was for and who was against the Bracero program back then in 1942. Against the program in Mexico, it's again quite interesting. You have, first of all, the Catholic Church opposed the Bracero program. Why is this, you ask? Well, on the one hand, the Catholic Church feared uh, the exodus, if you will, of, of, the, of the men from Mexico. The, the family unit might become, uh, um, might collapse. Okay, so there was concern that by removing the, the father uh, from the nucleus, if you will, the nuclear family, if you will, that that would have an impact on La Familia in Mexico. There was also a concern by the Catholic Church, frankly, uh, that the Mexican workers coming to the United States might become indoctrinated into the Protestant faith and even, they argued, morally corrupt. Uh, in fact, in my research on the topic, I find that uh, the Mexican Catholic Church uh, got uh, permission from the Vatican to allow Mexican priests, Catholic priests, to come with the Braceros to the United States. So again, the Catholic Church uh, was against the program uh, because of their concerns uh, of the impact on the family and, of course, moral corruption that they, that they argued. Uh, also against the uh, Bracero program in Mexico, and ironically perhaps siding with the Catholic Church, was the Mexican political left, los izquierdistas, the left political ideology. Uh, and so these folks were against the Bracero program because they were offended that the Mexican government was basically uh, succumbing to the American perception of Mexicanos as simply inexpensive, exploitable uh, labor. Give us your poor people, the, the cheap labor, the workers. And in fact, they didn't have to go very far to prove their point. The word bracero comes from the word brazos, arms. And so it, it was not, uh, again, a, a program seeking Mexico's young uh, intellectual students, you know, anyone perhaps with a, a certain preparations, mainly they were seeking for exportable labor forces. And this the left resented, of course. Uh, the other thing, in fact, to highlight this, this uh, uh, point, one of the most famous photographs out there of the Bracero program is a picture that shows a Bracero man uh, showing his hands uh, uh, to two people that were basically interviewing him. Uh, what they were looking for in his hands was calluses. They were not asking of him for his resume. In fact, his hands were his resume. They were looking for calluses, for cuts that were indicative, again, that he was a, a, a worker that worked with his hands. Again, the Bracero idea, the Bracero concept, the name comes from that. So that is, in a sense, the humanizing again. Uh, and the, the left, truly back then, resented this, uh, as many people, of course, do uh, today. The other uh, thing that uh, we can talk about, of course, of uh, people that were against the program was the Mexican industrialists. The Mexican industrialists, frankly, did not care if the poor farmers left, but they certainly did uh, have concerns about the limited skilled labor pool that they possessed in Mexico. And so they resented or opposed the Bracero program uh, on the grounds, as of course Mexican unions. On the American side, you have um, mainly resistance by the American Union. The American Union has always been rather 
resentful of uh, quote unquote foreign labor. And so the uh, American unions resented and were against the Bracero program. However, you have uh, the challenge which they met, of course, was by the American government responding uh, to uh, agribusiness pressures by lobbying by corporations uh, and that needed, of course, to have uh, the labor force. Uh, in fact, this, I don't think there's a better way to prove this dependency, this strong pull factor, uh, other than to uh, tell you that the American government, pressured by the American companies, require that any Mexican worker be anywhere 800 miles from the border within 24 hours. That tells you how much we were dependent on those workers. Because let me tell you something. At the end of the day, when you're at war, uh, we think about bullets, we think about weaponry, right? maybe technology. But one thing we really think about is the importance of food. And the food was essential. It was an important part of the victory, of course, against the Axis powers. So we are able to highlight again uh, some of the uh, push and pull factors that include in this case the Bracero program as a key part of that uh, the discussion. In closing, let's talk about other things about the Bracero program that are important. One, the, the Bracero program really cemented the dependency on Mexican labor in, in a number of ways. Uh, it is the classic example of a pull factor uh, and uh, it gave rise to the Mexican-American colonias. If you're looking at the importation, if you will, allow me to use that word, of some 4.8 million men. Many of them went back to Mexico, but many did not. They stayed here, they married, and they had children. And for example, myself, my father was a Bracero worker. Uh, the also Bracero uh, program um, became sort of like the, um, uh, I would say pioneer, perhaps is a word, you know, to use of later uh, labor uh, programs and policies, uh, even, even as controversial as it was. Uh, for example, there were other attempts, like the Compañero program that uh, was proposed, a guest worker program under the Bush administration as well. Uh, there's been many other examples that emanate from the Bracero program. But let's, again, consider something else for a minute. Let's, let's look at the whole last section that we've been talking about, push and pull factors. We first began looking into the late 1800s, and a transformation uh, in the United States Southwest in particular from a local plaza economy to national and international markets. We looked at mining, agribusiness, and transportation, it booming, if you will, and demanding uh, a pretty huge labor force at a time when we had also the end of slavery in the South, we had anti-Chinese, anti-Japanese legislation, all that gave rise to an early dependency on Mexican labor. And we can see that with the Engancha system, the 1970 immigration law, the quarter laws, the Bracero program again as a classic example of dependency. Obviously, in between these um, pull factors, you have also recession moments, correct? Like the 1930s. And so we see there uh, a anti-Mexican, anti-immigrant sentiment with the Mexican problem, repatriation, the Lemon Grove incident, for example, that we uh, also have seen. All that, I guess, is, is part of one package, one, one section uh, of these push and pull factors. Overall, we want you to uh, think critically about this and see how that part of those early 50 years, if you will, the 20th century, might mirror the present and the present debate over immigration in our nation. Another critical thing to remember and to point out, as we're discussing the push and pull factors, is along the way, the first and second generation of Mexican Americans who went off to war, who paid the price as Americans, and now demanded a sense of justice and equality. These will be folks that eventually their children will be sent to Vietnam and were part of the civil rights movement. One of the things that we often think about when we discuss civil rights, we often think of the 60s and 70s, but in reality, we look at a long history of a Mexican origin people that were resilient, that fought for equality and justice. We can go way back to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and of course the um, uh, Comité de Vecinos de Lemon Grove, uh, the case of Mendez versus Westminster, which eventually will lead the way to Brown versus the Board of Education and the end of segregation in the academic, of course, arenas. But really, overall, uh, the Mexican American community uh, was planting the seed for eventually the Civil Rights Movement, which we'll discuss.
in the following sections.